So we are the, uh, the propylene from our sales shale gas from ethylene. Uh, I'm Blake Gendron. I'm with Andrew Glace, Christian Rodley, and Ryan Lofield. And we are CB 2013. So why propylene? How many of you guys have cell phones? How many of you guys are reading out of folders? Pretty much everybody, right? How many of you are sitting in chairs right now? <laughs> So all those products depend on the fact that propylene is the major component in plastics. So our process converted ethylene, the ethane fraction of Marcellus shale, to propylene. As you can see, it's a very important process in a lot of the things that we use. So cars, Tupperware, <laughs> awesome stuff like that, planes. Uh, so it's a very important process in all the, in all the everyday things that we use. So the Marcellus shale basin, basically stretches from West Virginia, as far south as Alabama actually, all the way to Ontario, Canada. So the inciting part of our process is that we're taking this Marcellus shale and we're basically converting it to propylene. It's such an important uh, natural gas for us because we just discovered it and it's, it's, uh, it's, it's driving a lot of the processes we use today. So 500 trillion cubic feet uh, of natural gas that we discovered in America Obviously, there's the, uh, the Marcellus Shale that's out west. There's the Marcellus that's uh, in Canada. And uh, 23 cubic, uh, trillion cubic feet per year uh, is the consumption that we have annually for our, uh, for our country. It's, a, it's, a, it's an exciting thing. Basically, 20 years of uh, Marcellus Shale is what we have discovered in, in the United States. So our process is divided into three major uh, sub-processes. So the first is that we take the uh, the Marcellus shale and we take ethylene, we convert it to uh, and we convert it to one uh, butene. And the second is that we convert one butene hydro isomerize it to uh, two butene. And then finally, we take the uh, two butene and we convert it to propylene in a metathesis reaction. And now I'm going to talk to uh, Pastor Christian, who's going to talk about market analysis. Thanks, Blake. Um, okay, so in researching the market analysis for our product, propylene, uh, we found that the profitability is really being driven by two factors. The first of which, as you can see here, is the ethylene abundance. Uh, many chemical companies, uh, including Shell, are trying to take advantage of the high ethane content that's present in the Marcellus shale. Um, it's a particularly light shale gas uh, having over 70% um, ethane concentration where typical um, shale gases only have around 40. So they're really excited about this and can use this high ethane content to produce ethylene at in high quantities and at a lower price. Um, and so we contend that by building our plant directly you know, in proximity to theirs, we'll be able to get ethylene for, as our feedstock over the fence. And what this means is we'll be able to capitalize on a discounted price um, for the ethylene so that instead of being dependent on fluctuations in the ethylene market, which is traded as a commodity, uh, we can get it basically based on the price of ethane marked up with some profitability for them. And the reason we can do this is because we have transportation costs that are next to nothing uh, because we're going to be like right next door. and we have a steady high demand of um, over 400 kilotons per year. So it's basically a guaranteed sell for them. So uh, there's no reason why they wouldn't do this. So the, uh, the second factor is that there's propylene shortages. So again, as I said, that this Marcella shale has a, uh, a higher ethane content it, and it's better for ethylene, which means it's simultaneously worse for making the propylene by, by, uh, byproduct. And this uh, propylene demand was previously met by oil refineries, which, um, such as the refineries down at Marcus Hook, are all closing in um, due to lack of profitability. So, um, with these propylene shortages and an increase in the propylene demand, which is increasing at uh, an aggregate rate of 2.9%, and this is projected over the next 15 years, uh, already at 90 billion tons per year, uh, we see that this supply-demand gap is widening, and we'd love to jump right in there and make some money. Uh, 
Now I'm going to hand it off to Andrew, who's going to talk a little bit about our. Oh, sorry. So, uh, speaking of money, um, <coughs> our our plant is designed to uh, make at least 300 kilotons of propylene per year, which is a lot. Um, and our target was to go for polymer grade propylene, which, um, if anyone knows anything about propylene, there's chemical and polymer grade, and this polymer grade will allow us to access the market for polypropylene uh, to provide a feedstock for polypropylene, so which, as Blake alluded to earlier, is everything in your plastic devices. So um, our target purity, again, what had to be above 99.5%. And now I'm going to hand it off to Andrew, so he's going to go into our process. Um, so I'm going to start, uh, present a very simplified flow diagram uh, of our total plant. Uh, I'd just like to emphasize that this uh, diagram that I'm going to show you uh, really don't encapsulate uh, a massive amount of utilities and uh, infrastructure that also has to come along with our plant. So I'm just going to show you these uh, diagrams to describe the overall process. Um, so this diagram that I'm showing here is responsible for the first reaction that occurs in the process, uh, which is converting ethylene into uh, one butene. And the one thing that I'm just going to point out uh, about the process that was novel um, is that this reaction produces a large amount of heat. Uh, it's on the order of 25 uh, million BTUs per hour, uh, which is substantial and very difficult to remove, especially because the reaction is occurring at close to room temperature. So in order to solve that problem, we designed a series of two reactors, uh, both of which had internal cooling water coils, uh, and then also a pump around leak that finishes the cooling. Um, and that allowed us to keep all the equipment in this reactor section uh, within fabrication limits. Um, the other next process that I'm going to talk about is the isomerization, which is uh, responsible for the second reaction, which converts um, one butene into two butene. Uh, with a catalytic hydrogen feed. And the novel uh, aspect about this process is this bank of uh, alternating uh, reactors and uh, intercoolers. Uh, and this design allows us to, uh, allows the reaction temperature to vary over the space of about 20 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, about the desired set point for the reactor, which allows us to uh, maintain the selectivity to our product. Uh, but still remove the massive amount of heat, which is also on the order of millions of uh, BTUs for this reaction. Um, and then here's a flow diagram for the third process um, in our plant, which is the metathesis reaction. Um, and then this reaction, so our original catalyst selection for this process would have allowed us to carry out this reaction at approximately um, around 100 degrees Celsius, which is not that intensive for chemical processing. Uh, but that catalyst, which was rhenium-based, turned out to be prohibitively expensive. Uh, so we had to revamp our process to use a, uh, a, another catalyst that would operate at 550 degrees Celsius. And that presented a challenge because in the reaction when you're operating with hydrogen, or hydrocarbon streams at that high temperature, uh, you can introduce coking on, the, uh, on a heterogeneous or solid catalyst. Um, and so in order to deal with that problem, we designed these pair of reactors that operate in parallel. So under normal conditions, they provide uh, enough, they're large enough to provide the conversion that we need for our reaction. Uh, but in the case that one of the reaction, one of the reactors uh, encounters coking, uh, one of the reactors can be shut down and the other one can be still run so that the plant can be run at partial capacity uh, without uh, having to do a complete shutdown of the entire plant. And uh, so using this process, we did reach our project goals. Uh, our our uh, expected propylene output is 99.9% .9 pure. Uh, we are over, a little bit over our target of 300 kilotons per year. And then we also produce some byproducts that can be sold at um, percentages of gasoline value. So our goals were met for the process. And I'm going to pass on to Ryan, who's going to talk about our financials. Thank you very much, Andrew. So there are a lot of numbers on the screen above me, but the one that I really want everyone to focus on is down at the bottom here that uh, $240 million right there. That's the initial upfront costs that we're looking at. And I mean, that's a huge number. I mean, I get stressed out over just buying a $5 sandwich from day to day, you know? So, but you have to remember the scope of this project. We're looking at 300 kilotons per year of product, and that's massive. So obviously this, pro this process is also going to cost a massive amount of money upfront. But 
If you look at that number and compare it to just our yearly operating costs of nearly $340 million per year, it actually doesn't seem that large. Now, most of that operating cost is actually coming from just the price of our uh, main reactant, which is ethylene. And as Christian reviewed earlier, we're, we're kind of doing uh, a pricing model for that based on the price of ethane uh, coming from Shell. And although that number is really large, we are generating $390 million per year of revenue. And that's coming all from our product, our um, you know, high-grade uh, propylene, which we are producing. So in conclusion, what does this all mean? means that we have currently, at our kind of conservative pricing model, we have a 15% return on investment. So that's not extremely high compared to some of these other groups that we've seen today, but it's only going to be increasing over time. Marcellus Shell is developing, and the more that people drill in, into that basin, the more ethane is going to be coming out, the more ethane that's going to be produced, and the lower, um, it's going to lower the price of our reactant and increase the price of our product. So that gap is just going to be widening. So we need to jump on this right now, as soon as we can. As soon as Shell gets their plant up and running, we need to put this plant right there next to it. Because other companies are going to see this. They're going to see this increasing and realize that they need to jump in there too. So the sooner that we get ourselves into this market, the better. And with that, I'd like to thank everyone uh, for coming out. A special thanks to our advisor, Professor Cedar, and our uh, other advisor, Professor Fabiano, and also um, Mr. John Wismer, who actually recommended this uh, project from Arkham. Thank you. Any questions? Right, so that increase in supply is actually the supply, the, the supply of ethylene. So Marcella Shell is extremely rich in ethane, which um, is going to increase the production of ethylene while the um, Production of propylene is going to be going down. So the, the, does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's going to like the ratio, of the price cut of ethylene is going to be a lot lower than the, the price cut of propylene, especially considering that the overall demand for propylene is going to be increasing kind of nationwide. Right, so that's uh, that's actually one of the things that we're, is also novel about our process. The only separation that we need that uh, requires some refrigeration is one of these separations in um, the, the that cis process. Yeah, the separation to totally condense the propylene. Uh, but all the, all the other uh, separators only use cooling water. So that's how we cut our variable costs significantly. Um, yes, and our startup costs as well. So we, we reused it in uh, in a few places. Um, in the metathesis process in particular. Um, so is that another, is that another uh, area where you can do additional investigation? Uh, so we did significant investigation in that area. Uh, we didn't cover it in this presentation because we only had 15 minutes. But uh, so this heat exchanger here. Uh, this one is a feed effluent heat exchanger, and it uh, preheats our feed to the reactor to 622 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, and cool simultaneously cools the uh, effluent of the reactor back down to 677 degrees Fahrenheit. So, so, so you think you re reuse these as much as you can? Yes, and we also have all of our um, places where we're uh, we have intercoolers for our. Uh, compressor, compression units because as you compress the gas it uh, increases in temperature exponentially so uh, we have, we use those intercoolers to generate uh, low pressure and medium pressure steam uh, from cooling water so and then we use that steam to heat other parts of our process and just to add to that there's nearly a hundred pieces of equipment which have all been very specifically specified we just obviously didn't have the time here to and go into um, some of the caveats there. Any further questions? All right, thank you.